You're listening to At Large, a global affairs podcast brought to you by China U.S. Focus. Thanks for joining us, and here's your host, James Chow. Good morning from Hong Kong, where it's Monday, November fifth, the day before the U.S. goes back to the ballot boxes for the midterm elections, but a strategically important week elsewhere as well. In Singapore, the Bloomberg New Economy Forum is having its inaugural edition. China's Vice President Wang Qishan is giving the opening keynote, and also on day one, you'll see Henry Kissinger, Ariana Huffington, Janet Yellen, Dina Powell, Hank Paulson, and Li Xianlong. In Shanghai as well, the China. International Import Expo, a week-long fair involving some three thousand companies, is already underway. It's a strong symbol of globalization and free trade at a time when both are being placed under threat. The expo, also known as CIIE, is in its first edition. Xi Jinping, the president, opened it in Shanghai. He says China won't close its doors but stay open more than ever. Innovation, technology, shared benefits, and inclusive development. Were some of the buzzwords he used. Matt Bevan, the governor of Kentucky, is one of the people keenly watching the expo and how his state's businesses can get involved. He's long been a student of history. He's lived in Asia, and he's talking about the mindset going forward on what's going to be necessary to create a closer world. Thirty years ago, I lived in Japan, had a chance to travel around Asia. I've always been intrigued by the opportunity for the East and the West to meet on many fronts: intellectually, academically,、uh, economically. Bevan is a Republican governor, so it may come as a surprise given the current position of a Republican administration, which is engaged in a full-blown trade war with China. But if you look back to recent history, the Republican Party has long had a strong partnership with China when it comes to trade. You think about. George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush, and symbolically how they both came to Beijing in 2008 to open up the new U.S. embassy. So when we listen to Bevan, there's obviously an understanding of the nuances and what's involved in terms of the people who are conducting the negotiations and how differently they may or may not think. Uh, the Asian culture tends to be much more personal, much more relationship, much more long-term and patient. It has a different mindset. There's an old saying in Japan that I'm sure there's a Chinese equivalent of. It, it's "deru kugi wa uteru," which means the nail that sticks up will be hammered down. So the negotiations will continue. We're talking about two very different people: the American people and the Chinese people. Yet they have so much in common. They have overlapping interests. They're the two biggest economies in the world. They're the pillars of their parts of the world, and they also have the can-do attitude, which I think is unique to these two countries. That really anything is possible with a dream and with a lot of hard work. These are two countries, of course, that talk about the American dream and the Chinese. Dream. In countries and in peoples that trade with one another, don't tend to fight with one another about important things. They'll always be bickering around the edge, like any family might. Our society is more compassionate, open, and gracious. Go Chok Tong was Singapore's Prime Minister from 1990 to 2004, and that's him speaking in the background as he gave his last address as leader. He's just published a book called Tall Order because he's 1.9 meters tall. But he also spoke in that book about Singapore's previous role as a moderator in the China-U.S. relationship back in the 1990s. Of course,、uh, that's not necessary anymore. China and the United States have their own relationship, but look. Looking at the current trade war, he says China is reacting in the right way. Restrained, he said, dignified, not trying to ratchet up the dispute. And he says that's the right way to behave at this stage. And he says what China needs to do now is to really determine who speaks for the White House instead of who could serve as an intermediary to the Americans, as Singapore once did. Now, as we said, the midterms getting underway on the sixth of November in the U.S. 
as we come up to that, there have been new accusations of Chinese economic espionage leveled by Jeff Sessions. Individuals and companies, he says, stealing trade secrets, memory chips and aviation, two of the sectors he identified. Now, he says China must be a member of international lawful nations. And the new accusations, as he says, comes right before the midterm elections. But this is what the foreign ministry is saying in Beijing about those latest accusations. It's not the first time for the United States to try to sow discord among China and other developing countries in our unity and cooperation. It was immediately rejected by them. In my reply to inquiries in the past, I once commented, people can tell where justice lies. So when we think about the midterms coming up this week and we think about the accusations last week, is there a tie between the two? I think that timing is very important. I think it's always strategic. And maybe there's a lot of politics involved here. So now's the turn of Mary Laris. She's a professor of political science and international affairs at the University of Mary Washington. And she says there's a cost to all this. You can appeal to your constituents where you are, but something's going to happen. And she outlines the financial markets. We have seen that the U.S. stock market has been skittish. Uh, yeah, to put it mildly, I should say, you know, in the last week and a half. And so um, he wants to have, of course, you know, a good market to placate the market. Because you see, right after he announced the phone call, right, um, the market went up. You could look at, like, the timing of when he announced, yeah, we had this phone call. It was a great phone call. You know, we have some work to do, but, you know, um, we were able to, you know, converse, and then and the market went up. So what's going to happen after the midterms. Obviously, someone's going to have to give way at some point, or maybe not. And if they don't, then obviously, it's going to be the two peoples or the two countries that are going to suffer. Is there a vision going forward after this week? China needs to come to the table. And that puts Xi in a a, a tight spot, right? Because Xi and China can't be seen capitulating to Trump. Right. So so Trump really needs to work out a, like a win win situation for, for the both of the leaders to go to their constituencies and say, you know, this works for the both of us. Well, it's been a week of mixed news otherwise in China. One of the headlines is a bus crash believed to have been caused by a verbal then physical fight between the driver of the bus and one of the passengers that sent the vehicle flying into the Yangtze River. All 15 people on board are believed to have died. But also... Raymond Chow, who introduced the world to martial arts legend Bruce Lee, has died aged 91. Now, Raymond Chow may not have been as well known as Bruce Lee, but he was instrumental, as that report on the BBC said, in making Lee not just a martial arts figure, but a global superstar. Chow was born in Hong Kong and went to university in Shanghai. He began his career as a journalist before joining Shaw Brothers Studio, run at the time by Run Run Shaw, another huge figure in Hong Kong's cultural life. But Chow wanted something more. He knew that Hong Kong could create films that could capture the global imagination. And in Bruce Lee, he found a vehicle who could drive that. Films like 1973's Enter the Dragon that teamed up Global Harvest, his company, with Hollywood Studios. Now, Golden Harvest was a film production and distribution giant that was not only a vehicle for Bruce Lee, but produce almost all of Jackie Chan's earlier films and some of Jet Li's as well. And what I think it did is that it broke down the veneer of what people thought about the East at the time. Bruce Lee had a great impact on me as a child, even though I can't remember watching any of his movies. But going to school in London, there were very, very few Chinese boys there. I think there were only two of us in high school out of about 850 in total. As everybody would come up and say, you know, are you do do kung fu? Are you Bruce Lee? And they'll do the chopping actions with their arms and their legs. And of course, in some ways, it was very offensive because I felt stereotyped because I didn't feel that I related to Bruce Lee in any way at all. He just happened to look like someone like me with black hair and brown eyes and the same shade of skin. But apart from that, I didn't really relate to him at all. And so 
being confronted with that stereotype, I think, put me on edge a lot. But I've come to understand him recently in a very different way. I was back in London a few months ago, and a friend of my mother's told me at dinner that Bruce Lee, in a way, saved many young Chinese men at the time in England who were struggling, uh, who were being beaten up at weekends, who were subject to uh, frequent racial abuse. And he said uh, they trained uh, during the week after uh, knocking off their shifts at the takeaway or the restaurant where they worked. But more importantly, people respected them. They weren't just afraid of them. They respected them because they felt that all Chinese people could do martial arts like Bruce Lee. So in a way, he gave them a dignity. He gave them a respect. He gave them an identity. And uh, do you remember Liu Xiang, the Chinese? Chinese hurdler who won the Olympic gold medal for the 110 meters back in 2004 at the Athens Olympics and you know he really broke down so many of the stereotypes like I imagine Bruce Lee did decades before that Chinese men weren't just short they could be tall they could be fast they could be quick they could be physically capable they could meet on a level with their peers but also surpass them so I think a lot of Chinese men in the past have been demasculinized in a way they're seen as soft, not being able to stand up, not being able to speak English well, being very quiet. And in a way, I think Bruce Lee, Liu Xiang, Jet Li, people like that have done uh, a great favor in being able to shatter those images, to uh, be able to reintroduce the idea, as with all ethnicities and all people, that we all come in different sizes, different shapes, different characters, and we all have our individual personalities as well. You've been listening to At Large with James Chow. For more episodes, you can go to chinausfocus.com forward slash podcasts. You can also subscribe at Google Play Music, SoundCloud, and more. Thanks for joining us.